Now, welcome to GCDC TV. I'm Pastor Art Battle. I am so ecstatic that you have chosen to spend this half hour of your day with us as it relates to what it is that God is doing at Gethsemane Christian Discipleship Church. We are now about to embark on part three of our series that's called Detour. What we define as a detour, a spiritual detour, is when God changes your path to his and you choose his path over your own. So many times God is putting the orange barrels out. So many times he's putting out that the road is closed and he wants to take us on a new route. But we have to submit to his authority and allow him to bless us by taking us on that detour. We've gone through open and closed We've gone through also the three things that we learned with open and closed. It is what it is. Doors swing both ways. Perspective produces panic or peace. Last week we talked about what it means to be rerouted. Three things that we learned. Ask for help. Going and returning are not the same. And a new route equals a new journey. Well, today we're going to talk about what it means to receive an upgrade from Almighty God. All of us love upgrades. All of us love when we are being blessed by God to move us from one place to another. We're going to hear in this message how God blessed me with an upgrade on a flight that I was blessed to be able to take. And when you get an upgrade from God, there's nothing that anybody can do to stop it. And all you need to do is receive it and be blessed by it. The upgrade that we're going to be talking about is in Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. And I'm just going to read verse 9, where it says, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. And this is a story about a tax collector and a Pharisee. And sometimes we have the view of the Pharisee where we're looking down on somebody else. But the tax collector had the right view. And through his view, God upgraded him and said that his prayers would be answered. And that his prayers were righteous prayers that were heard by Almighty God. Receive the upgrade that God has for you. And I hope and pray that there's something that's said or done that allows you to receive the love of Jesus Christ through this message. Amen. Are you ready for the word? All right, we are in our last sermon of a three-part series. We are talking about detours. Say detours. detours. Now, what a detour is, and I'm going to go through these definitions fairly quickly. What a detour is, is the act of going or traveling to a place along a way that is different from the usual or planned way. It's also a road, a highway, etc., that you travel on when the usual way of traveling cannot be used. It's to go along a way that is different from and usually longer than the usual or planned way. It's to make someone or something go in a direction that is not planned or expected. And lastly, it's to avoid something by going around it. Now, the issue with a detour is somebody, prior to you experiencing wherever that detour is, somebody has taken a time out to say that there's something that has happened in that particular area where you need to go a different route than you normally go. And usually what they do, because our eyes pick up on colors, they'll use the color orange, and you'll see orange barrels, and then they'll put a big sign up. Because what they're trying to do is to give you warning that there's something on the other side that you need to avoid. And sometimes in our lives, we don't understand that God gives us the exact same orange barrels and the big signs. And many times he's giving you your detour two to three years before you've even experienced your accident. But many times in our lives, what we wind up doing is the physical aspect of living we don't carry out and the spiritual aspect of doing. Because when we see a detour, when we see that sign, and I'm going to go back to it just real quick. When we see this sign, we automatically in our mind say there's something else I got to do. And I'm going to go on a different road than I've gone before. And I'm not going to sit and complain about the fact that it's a detour. I'm going to just follow direction. And sometimes in our walk, we don't want to follow the directions of the Holy Spirit. When he says, listen, I'm going to take you on a detour and I'm going to take you on a new path and a journey that's going to take you away from some danger and some harm that you don't have to experience. And sometimes if you read a word, your word enough, you'll understand that there was a lot of spiritual people who took some detours. Moses took a detour and his was indicated by a burning bush. The disciples took a detour when Jesus just said, hey, come follow me and I'll change your very life. 
Right in this room right now, God has spoken some detours to us, and we're still sitting there waiting on him to do something when he's already told us what to do. So let's get to this next part real quick. Now, detours are necessary for these reasons. It's to avoid destruction or construction, to avoid delay or danger, and they're also necessary so that we can follow a new route with new direction. Let me just touch on this real quick, then we're going to run through a recap and then get to where we're going to be today. It's very funny how we as God's people want brand new stuff, but we won't do new things to get new stuff. We want God to bless our old ways, but give us new stuff. That don't make sense to me because if God is going to bless you to receive a new thing, he wants you to do a new thing in order to be able to get it. And watch this real quick. We want people to pre treat us brand new. We want folks to understand that we've been brand made brand new in Jesus Christ. But my question would be, if you've been made brand new in Jesus Christ and you to follow a new route with a new direction, then how come you're doing the same old stuff? See, I don't have an issue with worldly folk. You know why? When they speak about Christians and they say negative stuff, because if we are confusing them, then we need to be accountable ourselves first. If they hear us cuss like everybody else cuss, then we've confused them because you know what? Then it's not a new route with a new direction because you don't have a new mouth. Oh, I'm not going to curse because I'm brand new. I'm not going to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that I didn't used to do that. That doesn't mean that I haven't gotten to a point where I might struggle. But the thing is, is that I don't use those words any longer because a very wise man told me that it doesn't take a lot of brain power to use those kind of words. And if you were in the first service, uh, 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 Erica talked about the fact, Lady E said that you got to pray, you got to read, and you got to fast. And sometimes when you're about to use some words that ain't of God, you need to pray first and he'll regulate your mind. But this is the other thing. If you stop using a word long enough, it'll, it'll, you'll remove it from your vocabulary. And if you stop using other people as the excuse for why you use the word, you made me say it. No, they didn't. They didn't jump in your mind and pull that word out of your vocabulary and say, now use this thing. You just went back to the way that you used to do stuff. And so as a result, and real talk is this. At the end of the day, it's not the responsibility of the pastor or the under shepherd or somebody else to make the change inside of you that you got to allow the Holy Spirit to do in your life. If you want to be new, you got to do something new. And watch this. Sometimes you got to hang around some new people to get a new attitude. You can't have the same old attitude saying, oh, I love Jesus, but you just deleted the whole first part of what you said. And so when we get to this place, so it's a new route with a new direction, but let's run to some other stuff. So a spiritual detour. A spiritual detour is when God changes your path to his, and you choose his path over your own. Now, a spiritual detour is when God changes your path to his and you choose his path over your own this is a huge piece for me we as God's children love choice think about this you can choose when you leave out of here to go to McDonald's or Burger King or Five Guys or Pizza Hut or Taco Bell or KFC and sometimes we got too many choices sometimes you need to choose to go to your house and make dinner rather than eating the fast food that Amen. you've been eating because the thing is, at the end of the day, you keep telling yourself you want to lose some of those pounds, but when you go to those places, they don't feed you nothing but pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I done been there. I done been in that spot. But at the end of the day, if I'm going to choose a different path, I need to choose the path that God has for my life. That means that I got to open myself up to him taking me to a place that I've never been before. Then I got to choose his path over my own. Do you understand that we got to stop competing with God as it relates to what's best for our lives? You don't do that, and we're going to run down this street real quick. You don't do that with physicians. You don't do that with financial advisors. You don't do that with all these professionals that you pay this money to, but when it comes to Almighty God, all of a sudden it's a debate. Your doctor come in and tell you if you keep eating them foods, it's going to be a problem. You, the wise person changes what they eat. 
They don't go to the doctor and say, well, doctor, wait a second. Let me talk to you for a little while longer. If I keep eating all these high-fat foods and all these greasy foods and all the rest of it, you know, I think in my own great opinion, even though I've never been to college and all that other medical stuff that you got, I think I'm going to be okay. You don't do that. You don't go to your financial advisor who has been schooled in how to invest your money. You know, I think you really need to put my money over here. I just got a funny feeling about it. You don't do that. You don't go to your dentist and go, wait a second. You know what? I think if, if you do this, don't, don't put the Novocaine here. Just know what. Let me show you what to do. You don't do that. But my question is, why do we do that with God? Why do we try to tell he who loves us beyond our ability to understand how much he loves us? God, just do it this way for me. I need, I need to avoid all that pain and that heartache and that sacrifice. I need to avoid losing them people because, God, if I lose them people, I have defined myself by them folk. And if I lose them, I don't know who I am. And he said, that's why you got to lose them so I could tell you who you are. So let me get to the spot. So we talked about open and closed. Say open, open. closed. Close. Now, this is all based around a trip that I was blessed to be able to take to go to Kansas City, Missouri. And so I wind up going to Kansas City, Missouri, and I try to get on this plane. I get on the plane. I'm going to Chicago. I get into Chicago, and my flight from Chicago to Kansas City was canceled. And I prayed the whole hour that it took, and, and God just did not answer that prayer. He said, the flight's still canceled, son. Now, what you going to do? Because he had opened the door for me to get to Kansas City, Missouri, but he had closed that particular flight. And so there's three things that I learned out of that particular trip, and it's based in Isaiah 22 and 22. Three things that I learned was it is what it is, first thing. Second thing, door swing both ways. And then third is perspective produces panic or peace. Watch this real quick. I just got to drop something in your spirit. And number three, sometimes it has nothing to do with what God is doing in your life. It's just the way that you look at it. And you need, see, oh, I love God for this. In the Bible, he says, let those who have eyes see. Sometimes you need to pray to God to see your situation different. You could view the situation in such a way from a place of panic and despair. And God is like, why are you despairing when I am just leading you into the path of righteousness for my name's sake? You keep wanting to hang out in the valley of the shadow of death, and I'm trying to get you to some still waters and some green grass. And you keep looking at the valley of the shadow of death that's on your left, and the green grass is on your right, and you won't turn from that because you've been conditioned to always worry and to panic when problems happen instead of laying your problem at my throne and taking up my yoke, which is easy, rather than keeping your yoke, which I didn't create. So let's run to this place. So those were the three things I learned in the first half of my trip. Then I'm coming back from this awesome experience, learning more about discipleship, and I get there on Thursday, February 26th, and, and then all of a sudden, instead of going from Toledo, instead of going from Kansas City, Missouri, back to Chicago, here to Toledo, I wound up being rerouted. And you know, the funny thing about being rerouted is we don't like to be rerouted. We don't like when something is changed beyond our control. And many of us will say we don't have a control issue. And many times it's the people who say they don't have a control issue that got the control issue. <laughs> they want to tell you what they don't do. I don't have a control issue. Well, if you don't have that, why are you telling me that? Maybe you have it to a certain degree. And all of us, watch this, all of us like to control certain stuff. Think about it. You control what you wear when you get up. You control what you watch on television. You control what you eat. All of us have somewhat of a control aspect to us. It's not that control is a negative thing. The only thing that's negative is when you're trying to control other people and you ain't got control of yourself. And when you're trying to control God who is uncontrollable. And that's why you're out of control. So when I got rerouted, it was kind of cool. I had to get up, and I'll tell you these three things, but it was based in John 14 in the sixth chapter. I wound up having to go back to Detroit. Remember, I told you my original trip went from Toledo to Chicago to Kansas City. Going back, I went from Kansas City to Dallas to Detroit. That's not Toledo. 
But I wound up getting rerouted. And the reason I got rerouted was because there was snow and all this other stuff happening in Chicago. And I didn't have any control over that. So God said, I got another way for you to get home. And I go up to the lady, and I'm going to just take you through the three things real quick so we could run the description for today. I had to go up to the lady and tell her I had a problem, so I had to ask for help. Funniest thing is we got so much pride in our lives, we won't ask people for help. And pride comes before a fall. See, we many times don't want to tell people that we're going through something. We don't want to ask for assistance and help. We want to let them know I got it all together. I don't know of a Jesus follower that got it all together. Everybody got something that God is working on in your life. The only time you're going to get it all together is when you write in his right in his presence after you've taken your last breath. That's when you got it all together. But at the end of the day, I learned that I had to go up to this woman. I said, listen, I got a problem. I need to get to Toledo. And she said, well, I can't send you the way that you came. And so you know what was funny? It was some guys that were there, and they were veterans of the airways, I could tell. They had the suit. They had a little carry bag. They looked very professional, and they were looking at me like, you look like a rookie. You up there asking them for help. You don't know how to just get online and change your flight. I said, I don't know none of that stuff. I just went up. I said, miss, could you help me, please? Sounded just like a little kid. Could you help me, please? Humbled myself, head bowed low, just... Could you help me? She said, sir, I think I can help you. And then so I began to understand that the way that I came to Kansas City wasn't the way that I was going to return back to Toledo. So going and returning are not the same thing. Hmm. And then I understood the last thing, which was new route equals new journey. So I was about to go to a place I had never been before, which was Dallas. I wasn't going to go touring. I was just going to go to the airport kind of cool so I said all right fine and the cool thing about it and then we'll run into this sermon for today the cool thing about it was there was one more seat on the flight to get from Kansas City to Dallas and it was mine and then they was telling people they said listen you know what we got you you can't put your bag you're not gonna have enough room for your bag they put me all the way to the back of the plane I said how y'all gonna have me a brother all the way in the back of the plane <laughs> tired of this back seat stuff and so I told my wife, I said, listen, you know what, I'm, I don't want to be in Kansas City. And I just think that my wife heard my prayer, but I just believe God was like, son, I'm not going to put you in Kansas City like I did in Chicago. You ain't going to have to stay tonight. And so I get on this plane, and this guy, this Christian guy, I could tell he was a Christian guy just because of the way that he treated me. He wound up taking his jacket from out of the overhead bin, and I could put my stuff up there. So he did without so I could have. And then we got some peanuts and stuff, which was great. And it was only an hour. So I said, yes, God. And so I'm there in Dallas. And that's where we pick up the sermon for today. Say upgrade. upgrade. Watch this. The thing about an upgrade, and this is the last part of this trip from Kansas City to Dallas to Detroit. The thing about an upgrade, all of us want to upgrade, but we don't want the sacrifice that it takes to get an upgrade. You want to upgrade the way that you still do in your downgraded situation. And how can you be upgraded, still doing the same stuff? You trying to control the upgrade. And you can't control the upgrade. Then I was sitting just last night, I was finishing the slides, and I was, I was looking at Merriam-Webster's dictionary definition for upgrade, and I said to myself, God, this is so appropriate, because in the definition, it said to get something, watch this real quick, such as a seat on an airplane, <laughs> or a room in a hotel that is better than what you had originally. What do we say here? You can't script this, right? You can't script this kind of stuff. So I wound up getting what? I wound up getting a seat on an airplane and a hotel room because God was upgrading me the whole trip and I didn't realize it. But watch what happens because I'm going to run you to a scripture and I'm going to take you to the place where sometimes your upgrade hasn't happened because we haven't faced the fact that we're sinners saved by grace and we haven't humbled ourselves yet. So watch this. Just stand to your feet. This is the exercise part of the sermon. You get a chance to get up out of honor for God's holy word. We're in Luke 18 and the 9th to the 14th verse. In verse 9 it says, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. And you may be seated because I want you to walk through this story. In verse 10, it says, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. 
And a Pharisee, this religious leader, and a despised tax collector, he would take taxes and give to the Roman government, but he also would sometimes take more than what was due to the Roman government. And so the despised tax collector had done some people wrong. That's why he has the word despised before his name. In verse 11, it says, The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else, for I don't cheat, I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not, not, not like that tax collector. Funny thing is, in the household of faith, many of us have Pharisee tendencies. We don't want to talk about that, though. Because you know what? We wind up elevating ourselves, exalting ourselves, based upon the aspect of the transparent person who said that they just a sinner. Well, say, so you know what? I ain't like them. I didn't do that. I'm not that bad. Watch what else the Pharisee says. He says, I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. Now, the fasting and the giving of his tithes wasn't a bad thing. It was the perspective that he had. Because he wants to watch this. He looks at the tax collector and says, I'm not like him. And see, what happens in our walk, we do that inside the household of faith, then we wonder why people don't want to fill up the household of faith. We wonder why they go to clubs and bars because they're not judged by the people that are there. Well, we should be the spiritual household, the spiritual hospital for the sick. They wind up going to a place where they're not judged, that we know the scripture that says we should not judge anyway. And if we do judge, we're going to be judged by how we judge others. We know that, but we don't do that. And so judgment winds up being something that we use. We hit the gavel and we condemn them to something that God never said he was condemning them for. And so this tax collector, he's sitting there. This Pharisee says, I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else. He's a sinner. He just didn't say what his sin was. Right? Everybody got that little thing that they struggle with, that little thing that God is trying to work out of them, that thing that God is saying, listen, I'm going to get that out of you, but watch what happens. And this is the other thing. This is real cool. He says, I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector, but I'm a judge. And God says you're not to judge anybody. So watch this. In 13, he says, but the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. I want you to get the visual for the tax collector real quick. The tax collector has such a reverent fear and awe of Almighty God that he won't even lift his eyes to heaven. Watch what he said. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And then it says, I tell you this, this is Jesus, this sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Real quick. There's an aspect in the last portion of this, this scripture where God had me this morning, where many times we want to be upgraded by downgrading other people. And so watch this. If you really think about that, if upgrade is where you stand right now and you downgrade somebody else, you didn't move from your position. All you did was you looked down at somebody and rather than lifting them up, you just let, left them in that position. And you ain't where you are by yourself. You where you are because somebody lifted you out of your pit. Somebody prayed you up out of your mess. Somebody prayed you out of your pain, and so as a result, you're supposed to look down and lift them up and say, listen, I used to do that thing, or my sin might not have been that thing, but I know my sin. And so as a result, I'm not going to look down on you. I'm going to lift you up because I'm a sinner saved by grace. See, you get to some positions in your walk, and you forget what your life used to look like. You look in the mirror and you see who you are today, but don't forget the way you used to be because then you start to edge God and Jesus out thinking that you did it all yourself. You didn't clean up your mess, Jesus did. He's the one that does the upgrade. So watch this. So this sinner, he just said, I'm a sinner. And Jesus said that, he went home justified. 
Because he acknowledged just that he had a problem, that he had a sin problem. And then he says, for those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So watch this real quick. There were three things that I learned in this trip, and I'm going to walk you through the upgrade. As I'm there in Dallas, spending time in this uh, airport, there's a huge aspect of what's happening, and I didn't share this with you last week, and I'm sharing it with you now. When I went and asked the woman for help in Kansas City, she said, I can't send you back to Toledo via Chicago, but I could, I said, well, could you get me close to Toledo? She said, yeah, I can get you close. She said, I could send you to, I said, could you get me to Detroit? She said, yes, I could get you to Detroit. And sometimes, you know what, we wind up wanting God to do it our way rather than understanding that his plans trump our plans. I'm going to just teach you this as I go through these three things. So as I'm sitting in the midst of this situation and I'm asking for help and I'm humbling myself to this woman, letting her know that I have an issue, she said, listen, I got one more, I got one more seat on the flight going to Dallas. But when you leave Dallas, I'm going to upgrade your ticket. I said, so what's an upgrade? You're going to put me more towards the front of the plane? I said, because in the back, that was kind of an issue. You know, I didn't even know if I was going to get my stuff in front. She said, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a first-class ticket. I said, what? I said, look at God. I said, oh, my goodness. I said, so you had an upgrade first-class ticket for me to go from Dallas to Detroit, and I had to get first. I was getting first-class because I took a new route. See, sometimes we don't get the upgrade because we don't want to take a new route. So God had that seat, and I'm sitting there, and all this other stuff, and all this. It's, 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 a, it's a delay in Dallas, and I'm looking, I'm looking at the people, and I'm laughing. I'm like, I'm wow! I hope that there was something in Upgrade that blessed you in a mighty way. I hope that there was something over this last three weeks that God used to be able to touch you in a mighty way, as it related to open and closed, as it related to rerouted, and now today with Upgrade. There was something, hopefully, that you received that related to the spiritual detour that God may have you on right in this moment. But as it relates to upgrade, there's three things that we want you to be able to leave with. The first is that his plans, God's plans, trump my plans all day, every day. There's no plan that God has that I should think my plans are greater than his. With number two, the unexpected is unexpected. And so sometimes you can try to plan for the unexpected, but when the unexpected happens, don't panic. Just allow God to bless you with a sense of peace. And number three, upgrades always take longer. The issue with an upgrade is that it's a blessing, but the blessing that God has for you may take longer for you to receive as he's preparing you for the awesome blessing that he's already ordained you to have. I just pray that God blesses you immensely, that as you're on your spiritual detour and he shows you his path, that you choose his path over your own and that God may continue to keep you to make you the kingdom building Christian disciple, living the great commandment and the great commission that he has ordained you to be. May God bless you and may God keep you.